Happy New Year to you. Now, if you're anything like me, I've spent the last couple of weeks going through what I accomplished during the year and didn't accomplish. I'm a very ambitious person. And sometime around December 1st, I start hating myself. Does anybody else do that? And then by the time, about a week before Christmas, I start hating everybody around me. And then the new year ends, and then I have to get my composure, and I always say I've made too many goals, and I'm too ambitious, and I've got to focus more. And, and then I start making my plans for the year. And uh, hopefully you're thinking about what you want to accomplish for the year. Now, I want to start out with a very simple question. What if you got everything you wanted the day you graduated from high school? Just think about that for a minute. Oh, come on. The pretty girl, the handsome boy, the hot car, the job, you know, being the disco guy at your favorite, uh, you know, the disc jockey at your favorite club, all that stuff. Would your life be meaningful? Oh, you might be happy for a while. I'll give you that. Would you, would you actually be growing? Now, what's interesting is that our lives our works in progress. I like that Bernard Malmoud famous novel, The Natural, which of course there's the famous Robert Redford film, where Roy Hobbs, the great hitter, is laying in the hospital bed and Iris Gaines, his childhood sweetheart, comes in and she says, you know, Roy, I think we have two lives, the life we learn with and the life we live with. Well, I would add to that. I think we have multiple lives. We are versions of ourselves. We're version one, version two, version three, version four. And part of that has to do with what pulls us forward. Now, I use the term creative eyes as a, as a neologism, as a neologism. It's a made up term. And it means adding creativity to the ordinary things that we do in life, right? Adding creativity to the ordinary things. That's what we do every year. That's what we do with our New Year's resolutions. And, and, and creativizing is, is the activity of actually the process of doing this. And creativizers are people who do this on a regular basis. So every year, we kind of go through this cycle where we're actually sort of intentional about this. But there's, there's more to being an innovator than just having a creative mindset. And I think one of the things that people get wrong is what it really, what's really required to do this. So I'm going to start out by saying I think there are eight underlying rules that all of us have to admit to. They're almost existential. At the beginning of the year when we make our New Year's resolutions, because if we don't engage these rules, our resolutions never come true. So these are sort of guidelines. And I'd like to start out with one of my favorite quotes from Emerson. Man is a piece of the universe made alive. Now, when I grew up, I grew up in the, in the great state of Michigan that's surrounded by 90% of all the fresh water in the United States. We have more shoreline than the entire East Coast put together. So if you live in Michigan, everybody lives on water. Granted, it's frozen a third of the year, but we all live on water. So my grandfather was a Hungarian immigrant, and we would go fishing with him all the time. And one of the amazing things is when he'd take us out, he would show us how nature was alive. The fish were alive, and the, the clouds were alive, and the trees were alive, and everything around us was alive. And what he was trying to show us is that we are not the center of the universe, that everything around us that's moving is pursuing power, progeny, or pleasure. The world is growing, and the object is, can we grow with the world? So the first sort of rule, or the first guideline, is very simple. We are beings in the world trying to transcend it. The great philosopher Martin Heidegger coined the term beings in the world. And he said, you know, the problem with philosophy is we, we think we're gods looking down on the world. But we're actually encased in all kinds of challenges in the world. And we are, we are having to respond and draw on this world. Now, in a, in a, in a, wonderful, in a wonderful book by De, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, the great, uh, the great Jesuit philosopher of the last century, his big thing was that we are all in an act of becoming. But one of the challenges that, that we all have about trying to, trying to transcend the world is that even though we, we have this great capacity as human beings, the only way in which we can actually transcend the world is by the process of creativity. It is the reason that we create. Now, don't say that man is the only animal that creates. That's simply not true. Chimpanzees create, dolphins create, Chaldean crows create. 
But man is the only animal that knows, and knows he knows. Putting it another way, ladies and gentlemen, no one gets out of here alive. That is the existential condition, and that is the reason that we create. And what makes us unusual is we're able to share this with other human beings. If, in fact, a great Alabaman, a Harvard professor, if you know E.O. Wilson's work, talks about what distinguishes uh, human beings from everyone else in the world is our ability and our capacity to translate imagination into language and to share that. This is how we build cities. This is how we build airplanes. This is how we build civilizations. Rule number two, everything is both part of a greater system and a whole thing unto itself. Immanuel Kant's great, uh, great work, right? The, the critique of pure reason. Now, what Kant was saying is that all of us have this fundamental belief that somehow we're, we're unique or individual. Now, I had this happen to me a few years back. I was at Torrey Pines in San Diego, and there's a very famous statue there called the Self-Made Man. And it's a person kind of carving himself out of rock. So think of Michelangelo, you know, pulling himself uh, as an orthogonal twist out of a piece of marble. And what was interesting to me is when I first saw it, I fell into the same trap we all fall into. I said to myself, I'm a self-made man. I grew up in a HUD house. I have a million brothers and sisters. I came to college as a wrestler. Nobody thought I was going to do anything. I, work, I worked all the time, and I became someone. And I, you, you, go to, you ever have that moment where you're like, I did it? And then you start thinking through carefully. And what do you start thinking about? The, the teacher who saw something in you. The coach who wrote a letter for you. The guy who didn't need to give you a teamster job, but gave you a teamster job. The person who took you into the doctoral program, but didn't need to take you into the doctoral program. And what do you figure out immediately? No one in here is self-made. I don't care where you came from. You were not made individually. Now, every year around this time, I fall into this trap. And I'm guessing you do too. I read a self-help book over Christmas. I love self-help books. I'm addicted to them, even though most of them are terrible. And I start out, this is Santa Claus. I love Santa, he's my hero, Santa Claus. And I start out by saying, you know what I'm doing next year? I've worked really hard, and I just turned 60 years old, and I'm gonna, I've made a little money, I've done okay, I'm gonna quit it all, and I'm gonna move up north, and I'm gonna write a crappy fantasy book. That's what I'm doing. I've had enough of the bureaucracy. How many are with me? You've had enough of the bureaucracy? You had enough? I've had enough, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not taking it anymore. Yeah, I, you, you read the book too, right? I'm reading that book. I'm self-authorizing all the things I'm supposed to be. Except there's a problem. And that is my nesting doll fits inside, guess what? Another nesting doll. A bigger Santa Claus. Who's in this Santa Claus? Well, my wife Stanny is in this Santa Claus. What does she think about me taking the year off? If she likes it, I probably have a big problem at home, right? My dean at my school, my business partners, the people at NPR in charge of my radio program, they probably are not thrilled with me moving up north and writing a crappy fantasy novel. Now, on top of that is what? There's another Santa Claus. And this Santa Claus is called reality. <laughs> There's a financial crisis. Yeah, you th think about it. We had a 10-year run, guys. I used to be an advisor to the Federal Reserve. These things don't go on forever. Don't kid yourself. Right? There's a pandemic. Somebody decides to attack. There's a war. That's what you guys are all about. Yeah, that Santa Claus is bigger than the communal Santa Claus. Now, here's the point. Innovation and creativity is not created through freedom. It's created through constraints. It's the workaround. It's what do we do? Right? It's the person, oh, there's a terrible bureaucracy. It's so bad, nobody can get anything done until you see what? Somebody get it done. Then what do you do? Cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater. No! It's a person who's figured out how to be creative in a functionally restrictive environment. So the second rule, you're not self-created. You're not alone. We are both creating and created. Anything that you've become in life has been a group project. And consider yourself lucky. Somebody cared about you enough, or something happened to you that turned out pretty well. Now, this is my favorite quote of all time. And it's wonderful we have a Cambridge professor here. This was a Cambridge philosopher, a famous one named Bertrand Russell, won the Nobel Prize. The whole problem with the world 
is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves, but wiser people so full of doubts. Oh, my word. How you create is what you create. One of my, one of my favorite stories is I did something radical when I was a very young man. I was 25 years old. I had a PhD. I was a presidential scholar. So certainly I was going to go to an Ivy League school or do that. You know what I did? I went to work for a man with a $20 million pizza company. Five years and $5 billion later, it was Domino's Pizza. I could hear the people at PepsiCo and, and Pizza Hut think they were dull, drab, and awful. And it was a lot of fun building it. And you know why it was fun? Because everything that everybody else did was predictable. And what we did was different. Let me give you the big thing. You couldn't buy a Domino's Pizza franchise. I don't know if you know this. Back in the day when it was the fastest growing corporation in America, the 1980s, you had to go work for somebody who actually had a Domino's franchise and knew what they were doing. You had to be apprenticed. You had to learn to be a creative person. Just like the old guilds of Europe, you had to learn to be a goldsmith, right? And we gave you your first store, and no one knew what hit them. And what was even more interesting is people didn't know whether that was a real progressive thing or a real conservative thing to do, as if that ever even mattered. Another example of this, when I was at Domino's, I was brought into a group called AIS, Applied Integrated Systems. Those of you who are youngsters, there was a day before the internet. And I happened to be an advisor to Apple when Steve Jobs was being pushed out the first time. And Apple had a problem. Apple couldn't create enough software to compete with Microsoft and IBM. So what did we do? We created an internal system called AppleNet, which became something called Connect, which became something called iTunes. And what it was was a way to connect seekers and solvers. It was a way to engage a larger federation, a group of people, in order to create software, in order to compete with other corporations. The notion was, even though these other businesses were in different businesses, they didn't create the same way. The notion is, are you willing to change the playbook? And in order to do that, you have to change the way you think about things. Even if you were to be your best self, if you were to try to use the bureaucracy to create radical innovation, what you would create is quality and efficiency at scale, and you would inadvertently destroy your forward position. And I'll talk about this later. So how you do something is what you do. And here it is, New Year's, a great example. Oh, I'm going to lose weight. How are you going to do it? I'm doing the secret diet. Oh, how's that going to work? I'm eating, I'm eating kale for three, day, three meals a day. First of all, one meal is enough, right? It tastes like an ashtray. It's terrible stuff, right? <laughs> you know, in order, to, in order to lose weight, you got to do what? You got to build it into your lifestyle. You got to go to the gym. You got to eat slightly differently. How you create is what you create. Lesson four, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you're heading. Now, it's interesting to me that people think they're going to be creative without ever practicing. You ever notice that? Now, I can tell in this room, everybody, if you took out a piece of paper and drew a picture of your spouse, I could tell you at what age you stopped learning to draw. Speak a foreign language, play an instrument. It doesn't matter whether you're 8 or 80, you're going to go through the failure cycle. You ever wonder why venture capitalists give a lot of A round money to a lot of different people, right? What I'm doing is I'm giving you all $10,000 for the same disease state. Why am, I, why am I doing that? It seems wasteful, doesn't it? But what I'm doing is I'm accelerating the failure cycle and all these folks down here, they get something promising. You look like pathetic losers, but it turns out you were winners. So what I'm doing now is I'm doubling down in B round, and I'm giving you guys 10 times that amount of money. It turns out that our folks in the front row here, who would have ever guessed it? It turns out that they're our big winners, and they're going to get my IPO. The Templeton Foundation study, 1% of 1% made 89% of all the capital gains. That's where the 1% on Wall Street number came from. The rich got richer. Why? Because they understood that you cannot avoid the failure cycle. You can only accelerate it. You know what a loser is? A loser is somebody who goes, go big or go home. Oh, I love the recession. All those arrogant bastards went home. <laughs> Goodbye. Real innovators hedge. You want to see the greatest movie ever made on innovation? Watch the movie Moneyball. Watch it over and over and over again. 
And don't forget the first six weeks they wanted the fire Billy Bean, right? Don't forget it. And don't forget he didn't win the playoffs. Why? Because he stopped shuffling the lineup. It's always version one, version two, version three. Can I move the runners along? And where am I getting momentum? So where in your yearly plan are you going to fail? Where is that in your plan? Or is your plan effortless superiority? That's my favorite. Effortless, I'm effortless superior. It's all going to work. The other one that really bothers me, and I see this sometimes in the military, feigning humility. Feigning it, acting the part, being a poser. The issue is, if you really have humility, you don't believe everything works. You believe some things go kaboom. Hope I didn't hurt anybody, right? Number five, every man takes the limits of his own field of vision for the limits of the world. You know, one of the things that I find particularly bothersome these days <clears throat> is what's happened with social media. There's a term for this called confirmation bias. Have you ever noticed that all the people on your social media page who, who, who call other people stupid, you ever seen that happen? You ever notice they're the stupidest people on your page? You know why? There's a, there's a term for it called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It means they're not very self-aware. And what happens to social media, what's called micro-segmenting? So this is, a, this is a marketing trick. You're playing right into it. We're knowing what you're going to do next. What happens if somebody on your social media page doesn't believe all the same crap you believe? Doesn't listen to the same alt band, doesn't go to the same church, doesn't have the same political views. What do you do? You unfriend them. The Spanish Inquisition couldn't have thought of that. On a dark night, on a dark road, people disappear. <laughs> I've spent my life studying what are called creativity clusters. Groups, why, why groups have creativity? I live in this little town called Ann Arbor, Michigan. 116,000 people, has $2.8 billion in venture capital. We have the most venture capital per person in any city on the planet right now. Why is Ann Arbor any different than any other city up north? And it's very simple. You walk through the town and what do you see? You see all the, you see all the different races. You see all the different occupations. You hear all the different languages. And the same is true for the 30 other places on the planet that produce almost all the intellectual property. What is it about diversity that produces innovation? It's simple. When people don't come from the same place and they don't think the same way, what do you get? Conflict. Innovation is the result of the creative power of constructive conflict. On your social media page, if you never meet the loyal opposition, you continue down your blind spot road. You only see one thing. You become dumber and dumber and dumber. You become Dunning-Kruger. Spread it out. Reach out. If you're straight, read The Advocate. If you're white, read Ebony. Expand your mind. Engage in the other. If you're a Democrat, watch Fox. If you're a Republican, watch MSNBC. You'll live, okay? <laughs> because innovation is not the result of compromise. I'm not talking about compromise. I'm talking about a third way. I'm talking about Hegelian logic. I'm talking about Taoist philosophy. I'm talking about when two things that don't agree are meeting in a way that's respectful. You create a third way, a better way, a new way. In my opinion, the American way. That's what we're about. That's our unique strength. Right? This is the great experiment. Everyone is from some place. It's not just a moral issue. It's an economic issue. Six, my favorite philosopher, John Dewey. I built the Innovatrium, the original Innovation Institute, across the street from the original Dewey School. That's right, you guys from Chicago. The original Dewey School is in Ann Arbor. Thank you very much. Look it up. Now. The self is not something ready-made, but something in continuous formation through choice of action. It's, it's an act of volition. You don't just wake up one day. You have to decide you're going to create yourself. That's what New Year is about. That's what building this is about. But here's the thing. Everything costs something. Whoever tells you different is trying to sell you something or sleep with you, one or the other. You know, you're okay with that. I got it. All right. <clears throat> now, I'm coming back from Miami the other day, and this lady sitting next to me says, well, you know, she wants to chat. Okay, I'm going to chat. I'm a nice guy. And she says, what do you do? And I, you know, I write a lot of books and do a lot of things. She says, oh, I'm, she says, I'm writing a book. 
I said, oh, and I'm trying to, you know, you try and be engaged, even though you're really tired, just want to go home. Oh, really? Tell me about your book. Well, you know, I'm a lawyer, and I wrote this book, and it's all, a, it's, a, it's an intrigue book, it's a suspense book, and, you know, there's, uh, there's murder and mystery, and I said, oh, wow, that sounds, that sounds amazing. Tell me a little bit about, uh, have you got an agent? Oh, no, I haven't got an agent yet. Oh, do you, uh, you need a recommendation or something? No, no, not yet. I said, oh, uh, do you, have, you, have, you, have you targeted a publisher? No, no. So, well, are, is your manuscript ready? She said, no, I don't really have a manuscript yet. I said, oh, uh, um, what have you got? She said, I I've got an outline. I said, oh, good, how long have you been working on the book? She said, about 15 years. Okay, now, just a, just a fact check for a minute here. Is this woman ever going to write a book? No. You know it and I know it. And I asked her, what's stopping you from writing the book? You know, she, you know I, um, I do Pilates. And I volunteer at the Humane Society. She's a really nice woman. I'm a lawyer. You know, sometimes I have to work late. And what, what am I thinking as a writer? You think what? If you want to write a book, how do you write a book? You get your sorry ass out of bed every morning. And you write a bunch of pages. And what happens at the end of the day? You say, I'm never going to be a writer. I totally suck. This is terrible. I'm going to do it again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a socially acceptable pathology. But here's the question for you. You want innovation? What are you willing to give up? If you give up nothing, you're still flying the old spacecraft, you're still doing it the old way, what's the likelihood you're ever going to write a book? Never. When do you have to start doing it? Now. Do you try and do it all in one fell swoop? That's what people do at the New Year. I'm going to go on a diet. It's all going to work. I'm going to do this really stringent thing. About 30 days in, what do we notice? You all fall down. Doesn't work. Why? You overplayed your hand. It's the guy you go golfing with who always thinks he's going to make it on the green with one shot. Good luck with that. Even Tiger Woods doesn't do it right anymore, right? So the notion is it takes, oh, it's a little, it's hard to do. What are you willing to give up? The next one, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence becomes an act of rebellion. Right? Are you willing to free yourself. I had a very interesting conversation. I've been married for a quarter of a century. But my wife made a comment one time, sort of in, uh, in passing. She's from Indonesia. And she said, what, what really strikes me about America is that it's the freest country in the world. And you know, this is how people see us. It's the freest, most opportune company in, country in the world. And yet most people do the exact same thing. You ever notice that? You're, you're slaves to the dominant logic of this culture. You all do the same things. You fill your head with the same stuff. Interestingly enough, I love the old Western movies that I think put this in a nice perspective. You remember the old John Wayne movies where Gabby Hayes or Walter who used to would ramble into camp? The cavalry ain't coming. The cavalry ain't coming. What did it mean? It means only a few things. Run, Forrest, run. Or I'm going to fight the man. That's my favorite. Millennials. This is my favorite. You guys, I'm going to fight the man. You haven't even seen the man. The man's going to put a can of whoop ass all over you. He's going to hit you upside the head. The man's going to whoop all over you. Good luck fighting the man. Even when you become the man, you're fighting the man. You might don't know who the man is. I thought someday I'd get all my chevrons and I'd be the man. And even I'm not the man. There's another nesting doll on top of me. Yeah, you all want to be generals. You think you got to take crap. These guys up here have to take an incredible amount of crap. They can tell you what kind of wine goes with crap, right? That's what goes on. <clears throat> yeah. The cavalry ain't coming. You want innovation in the Air Force? You want to recreate yourself? No one's going to save you. I'm sorry. They're not. No, it's just like some, if I, oh, if I, here's the 10 secrets to attracting the, no. No. First, no. No one's ever going to save you. No marriage is going to make your life perfect. No job is going to make it all work for you. No. That's an existential moment. You have to figure this out yourself. You're free and responsible. I'm sorry I didn't make up the world. I just live here like you. I'm a being in the world. Henry Bergson, the guy who kind of created psychology, Elan Vital, this guy. To exist is to change. To change is to mature. To mature is to go on creating oneself endlessly. I got a story I want to tell you. I was in uh, Hartsfield in Atlanta the other day, and there's a guy screaming at the monitor. Right? You ever been in Hartsfield's crazy airport? 
So I had to go up to the guy. I'm like, what? I'm thinking something happened? You know, where are we being invaded? And he said, no. My representative, he's a flip-flopper. I said, well, what, what happened? My representative, where I'm from, my, my congressperson, was on a committee, and it was all about controlling this thing, and, and, and he read this report, and he changed his mind. He's a flip-flopper. And I said, I, I'm not understanding this. What happened? He, he, he was really an advocate for this one position, and then he read this report, and he changed his mind. And I looked at him, I said, isn't that what intelligent people do? I thought he was going to hit me. I'm going to have a fight in the Atlanta airport. I'm not going to get home tonight. The guy's dominant logic was so strong that he was unwilling to adjust any of his positions because of what he believed. And that's what most of us do. Most of us start by judging somebody. We don't start <clears throat> by, by saying we're going to have to grow to the next position. We don't start that way. Well, that leaves us kind of with our, with our final piece here. We aspire to wholeness, but we never achieve it. You will never become whole. The, the, the great uh, psychologist Carl Gustav Jung calls this individuation. He says, only at death do we ever become whole. Right? And if you're, if you're a believer in a faith, this is the whole point of your soul, sort of the, tra the transcendence of the soul. But, you know, I want to give you an example of this. One of my favorite heroes is Benjamin Franklin. I, does anybody else love Ben Franklin? I love Benjamin Franklin. Because <clears throat> he's a problem. Can you imagine living next to this guy? He's a runaway when he's an apprentice. He then apprentices himself to uh, 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 the, uh, the printing business, but he does it in a way that he lies about who he is. He, he masquerades as, as a woman. And he sort of, he, he does this whole thing with letters. And he gets this huge sort of syndicated columnist following. Then he becomes the printer himself. Then he goes on and, and he, he creates the first public library. He creates a syndication system all throughout the East, and, uh, East Coast at the time. He then moves on to create one of the first great universities. He then goes on to become a scientist. You know, to, you know the Gulf Streams, electricity, then event stuff, the Franklin stove, you know, the, the lightning rod. Then he, becomes a, then he becomes sort of the great man. He becomes a diplomat. He becomes a patriot. Benjamin Franklin is constantly pulling himself forward because why? Because he feels his life is incomplete. It is incompleteness that pulls him forward. Not completeness. It's not wholeness. Wholeness is not the, the game. The game is getting to wholeness. In fact, Benjamin Franklin was a terrible husband and a worse father. But it was his incompleteness that pulls us forward. So remember as you're making your New Year's goals. Remember to, to leave room for the stuff you don't know now. Leave room for the stuff that when you, when you look back at today, you think of it just like when you graduated from high school. All the stuff I want now is probably what I'm not going to want in the future. So putting it all together, <clears throat> we're beings in the world trying to transcend it. We're created and creating. How we create is what we create. We can't avoid failure. We can only accelerate it. We grow through constructive conflict. Everything costs something. The cavalry ain't coming. And we aspire to wholeness, but we never achieve it. This is the beginning of your mindset to your New Year's resolution. Putting your resolution into something that's actually something that you can create, something that we come back in a year, you could say, I've actually achieved this. Now, I want to talk about the creativizing mindset. How you need to think about this. <clears throat> now, many of you have, are familiar with this model. I'm the third researcher on this model. The competing values framework, or the innovation code, or the innovation genome, whatever we're calling it, the Michigan model. And the notion is that there are these four different types. Now, most of you know, if, because I've been here before, that most of my work is on strategy. It's on predicting the outcomes that organizations produce, particularly in the stock market. So most of it has a very quantitative aspect to it. But what's very different about this than almost any other model is it's not really about you. It's about the situation in which you find yourself, the big nesting doll. It's about the community in which you're surrounded with, the middle nesting doll. And it's about you and how those three things interact with each other. And when we are aligned, which I think is one of the big things we think about around here, what actually works for us. And when we're misaligned, what actually works against us. But I want to point something out that's very important. Most organizations have two functions, just like people. One is to maintain and one is to grow. 
To maintain is the reduction of variation. To grow is the increasing of variation. Innovation and creativity are a form of deviance. Deviance is created by what kind of people? Deviance, thank you, deviance. Do you feel like deviance? Yeah, the only way you're gonna change anything this year is if you're willing to deviate. So this model is based on the notion of diversity, but it's also based on the notion that we're not trying to align, we're trying to use conflict constructively. So I'm gonna play my cards on the table. I just published an article for the Duke Dialogue, Duke University, and one of the things I publish is I really don't believe in ambidextrous leaders. I don't. Oh, I can do it all, I'm a triple threat. I, you know, I knew the Steve Jobs of the world. I've been in over half the Fortune 500 companies. I know these people personally. I can count on one hand how many ambidextrous people I've ever met. They're unicorns. They're almost mythological creatures. Most people who get ahead in the world do it as a village. They do it with other people. They do it with the very people that drive you insane. How about that for a New Year's start? Where are you going to go out and find the person who makes you insane and make them your partner? Yeah, it's not abstract now, is it? So let me take you through this. These are the four positions. The artist, which we all have an artist archetype in us. Sometimes it's stronger or weaker. It's like being right-handed or left-handed. Right? So these are things that we have in different degrees. The engineer who does things right. The artist who does things new. The athlete who has to win does things now. Right, and the sage who does things that are going to last, kumbaya, sages, kumbaya. And how do these things go together? So the care and feeding of the artist. So as you think about your, your New Year's resolution, I want you to think about the care and feeding of your inner artist. The inner artist likes what? They like to be new. The inner artist thinks perfection is death. The artist wants to be new. The artist likes to build things. That's me. I love to build things. Once they're built, do I like to run them? No. I don't like to run them. I get bored. Right? I have to tinker too much. So the artist is great because they love ambiguity. They love taking risks. They're, the artists are crazy. You ever notice at, at, the, at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider? Anybody remember this story? Five years ago, CERN, Switzerland, the Large Hadron Collider. There are seven Nobel Prize winners. Two of them believe when you fire it up. They're get, this is the God particle, the Bose, right? the Bose-Hicks. The moment of truth, the great, that great uh, Oxford philosopher, 1966. Right? The, the moment of truth. Two, two Nobel laureates, Nobel, they don't get any higher than that, believe what's going to happen. They think it's going to create a black fissure and destroy the universe as we know it. They bet a beer and pulled the switch. See you in hell, Jurgen. Right? These are greens. <laughs> Never, ever tell the greens there's a switch because the greens will have to touch the switch. Lie. There's no switch. Because the greens will always drive the Harley into the pool. <laughs> They're greens. They're always testing boundaries. They're always finding new ways. They're wiggly. What greens want is greens want freedom. Now, I have a secret for you. The Air Force is filled with greens. There are many in this room. And you're hiding in plain sight. Look at, yeah, I see you. I, it's like romper room, Miss Ann. I see every damn one of you. You're here. I know you're here, but you're wiggly. You're wiggly and wily and weaselly, and you figured out how to be in this system without being caught. You're sort of living at the edge here. Yeah, I see you. Now, the opposite, the engineer. You can hear the engineers when they came in. Did you notice the engineers were here right on time, singing, hi ho, hi ho. It's off to work we go. And they're using their phone, and they know how to do crap on your phone that you guys don't know how to do. And they, you know, they've they checked off every task. Yeah, right way, and they kissed your ring, you genuflect your kid, whatever it is. These are, these are engineers. They love large-scale projects. You ever hear an engineer talk about big projects? They love to say, like, yeah, you know what? We've got a 144-step method here we're using at the Air Force. And, uh, and uh, it has 33 different processes you have to be checked out on. They love acronyms. That's a CPI 43-9. And everybody's got to be checked out on something. Because if you're not, it's like drunk driving. Are you checked out on that, soldier? No, I'm not. Well, you've got to get checked out on that. They know the rules about everything. And it's a complicated system. It's like McDonald's, you know, where the illiterate kid presses a cheeseburger button. And simultaneously, somebody shoots a cow in Argentina. Bang! And everything in between happens. Smithers, come here. These are these guys. They know all the rules. 
So their technical expertise, they love engineering, they love to, boy, that was our talk this morning. Did you notice that half the talk was really fascinating, then it turned into the techno geek talk, and the other half, you were all tuned in. Ooh, look at the tail feathers on that one. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> They want more responsibility. They're trying to achieve rank. Now, I hope you can see that the first tension is what? There's a tension between your artist and the tension between your engineer. Now, most of you are going to try and avoid this tension and compartmentalize your life. I'm suggesting the exact opposite. I'm suggesting your inner artist needs to meet your inner engineer. Because if the inner artist goes unchecked, nothing is buildable. If the inner engineer goes unchecked, nothing's interesting. Everybody follow this? Put them together, you might have a shot at something. Now, I told you, I'm, a, I'm an avowed, it's like, being a, it's like being an alcoholic. I'm Jeff, I've been an artist, and I've been sober for, you know, that sort of thing. <clears throat> the grace of God, right, that thing. All my right-hand people have always been reds. Why? Because I know that's my blind spot. I know where my dominant logic ends, and I'm a terrible hypocrite. I hate, I hate collaborating with reds because you're insanely detail-oriented. But I know I need to collaborate with you. Do you see the difference here? I don't like to. I'd, I'd love to tell you I do. I'm not that big of a person. I wish I were. But I'm not. But I know that I need to do that. Some of my life, I get to be a green. I built these innovation labs. And some of my life, you know, I'm a professor at a top school. I'm on all these journals. I have to figure out if you did the right method. And is this sound science? And we wear funny hats. You know, in funny ties, you were in the yeoman of the guard as your junior year, whatever the hell that stuff is. So we have to have situational efficacy. We have to act appropriate to our situation. But it doesn't mean we have to be aligned. There's also our inner athlete. I'm married to an athlete. Boy, boy, am I married to an athlete. I always tell people, I know who wears the bossy pants in my family. They challenge everything. Everything is a, a scrap. If you say the sky is blue, boy, it's not blue all the time, is it? And they want to argue over everything, and arguing is fun. What is it Shakespeare says? His unfortunate quote, dogs are made for the gripping. Yeah, what Shakespeare mean by that? He means dogs are meant to uh, compete. Now, I love dogs, so I hope they're not meant for the gripping. But here's the point. Blues are all about pursuing key goals and overcoming barriers and winning, and the Air Force is filled with blues. Think about, all you have to do is look at the language. What's your team called? Go team, win team, strike force, you know? <laughs> Tiger team. Who's the head? Chainsaw, hitman, the great white shark. These are not nice people. These are gangsters, right? We're going to go rip them apart. Yeah, got it. I got it. This is, this is boomer culture. I'm a baby boomer. Sorry, junior people. We went to the moon. We licked the commies. We built the net. Ugh. What did you do? Uber. <laughs> Get some ambition. We also move a lot, marry a lot, hurt each other a lot. There's a lot of downside to it. But traditional American culture has, has tilted up to this point towards blue. And that's part of the challenge we're having, isn't it? Part of the challenge is, you know, hit first, ask questions later. Now, this is our, these, are, these are millennials. There are also some people who are boomers, but this is the sage. This is about community building. This is about doing the long-term thing, saving the environment. You know, treating animals humanely. Did this chicken have a name? Was he treated well? Yes, his name was Sebastian the chicken, and he was hand-felled until he was 10, and then he was killed in a humane way, and we're going to eat him today. <clears throat> With kale, okay. <laughs> so it's all about developing people and curating your social self and Snapchatting each other and giving, uh, giving money to people who are in other places to help them pull themselves out socially. And, you know, let's get rid of straws in Seattle because we're killing the sea turtles. I didn't even know there were sea turtles in Seattle. Who knew? There probably aren't, but we got to get rid of the straws anyway. This is this group of people. Now, we make fun of them. But don't, because some people my age are, are yellows, and they're incredibly important because they connect dots, and that's what the Air Force needs to do. You need to reach out and connect dots and build community, and that's what you need to do as a person. You need to be inclusive and, and connect dots. But what's interesting to me is if you think about this for a minute and what the Air Force is trying to do to expand out, to create a more inclusive Air Force, this is what the future looks like to me. 
The future looks like a few things. I don't know if you know this, but in the past 15 years, we went from 10,000 publicly traded corporations to under four. So corporations are no longer the way people are competing. They're competing in federations. These are sages. Three things about, about sages, about young people. Do you know that over half of all births to women under the age of 30 are outside of marriage? Marriage is no longer normative. I've been married forever. I'm a boomer, right? But young people aren't married, and the more educated the woman, the less likely she is to be married. This is a fact. Number two, when we ask young people what they want to do for a living, do they want to go to the, to the Air Force? Do they want to work for General Motors? What do they want to do? Oh, I want to work for myself and my friends, and I want to have meaning and impact. And I want to spend six weeks off and hiking in Tanzania and curing river blindness. These are young people. <laughs> These are all good things, boomers. Don't kid yourself. You wish you could go hiking in Tanzania, too. Mia culpa, mia culpa. Finally, what's the fastest growing religion to people under the age of 30? It's no religion. Plus 19%. So for the first time in American history, we're seeing a culture that's opted out of marriage, capitalism and religion. Now you can be mad about this and you can judge yourself. I'm a capitalist pig. I've been married forever, right? And I'm a practicing Roman Catholic, <clears throat> right? An old Jesuit. So you can be against this all you want, but this is what's coming. And what's happening is for the first time we're seeing a generation that's opted out of institutions, the very institutions that freed my generation, this generation has opted out. Rather than vilifying young people, and young people you rock, Right? I'm making fun of you, but you rock. You represent the future. You should look at what they can add to this, to this discussion, add to this world. They're the future. Now, most of the time, when you look at the political ethos right now, or the health care debate, it's these two groups against each other. But should we make money at health care, or should we cover everybody? But the real issue is what? Both of those positions are what? They're ridiculous. They're ideological. They're dominant logic. The real answer is what? Engaging. Right? Engaging. These two cultures are different, but we can engage these two cultures, and you can do this yourself at the beginning of your life. So how do we do this? First of all, let's go back to our nesting dolls. Start by looking up. In what situations do you typically fail? In what situations do you succeed? And don't go, oh, it's outrageous fortune, and fall on your sword. Where is it that you're good? And stop this baloney, we're all going to be Renaissance people. You're right-handed or left-handed, and your life experience is telling you that. Stop trying to be good at things you're not good at. Try and be great at things you're good at. There's a difference. I only do three or four things. My job is to do them really well. That's it. Then I have other people do the other things. It's a good philosophy in life. So look up. Where do you fail and succeed? So when you make your New Year plan, plan to be in more places where? Where you succeed. And plan to avoid what? Where you fail. And you know, you read the books, well, if you just think it, it'll happen. Yeah, that'll work. <clears throat> right? Magical thinking, that's real helpful. Look around. Who are the people that are around you when you fail? If you've got teenagers, you know how important it is to tell your kids what? Who are your friends become, your friends become your successes and failures. And the biggest thing with young people is what? Lose the terrible friends. Keep the good ones. Surround yourself with the best people you can be with. Who are the best people in your life? And remember, some of the greatest innovators are invisible. Somebody who gave you, a, you who let you took a charge against earnings, who gave you a couple days off. Maybe somebody looked really like they were anti-innovation, but they actually were a friend. Right? Don't judge a book by its cover. That's why we have that saying. Next, look inside. What is it that you really want? That's the problem, isn't it, every year? The problem with your yearly resolution, I guarantee, if you ask yourself this in the quiet of the night, your big problem every year is what do you really want? And the answer is you don't know. And the reason you don't know is you've let everybody else walk in your clean mind with their dirty feet. What is it you really, really want? Students come to me all the time and say, I want to tell you what I want to do. And you know what I always tell them? I don't care what you want to do. I care what you're designed to do. What are you designed to do? What's the evidence of that? What's the evidence that that's wrong? And then finally, be willing to take a higher point of view and look down at yourself, objectively, honestly. Those are hard moments. They're dark nights of the soul. 
right? We have this notion that we're better than we really are. And at the end of the year, in addition to making new goals, let's reflect for a minute on what we really fell short on and what we will continue to fall short on as long as we keep deluding ourselves. What is it that we really are? <clears throat> and then own it. This is it. This is who I got. What is the number one year for divorce in marriage? Anybody know? By far, the number one year where people are divorced. Anybody know? Overwhelming. It's year one. What do you figure out in year one? He's not going to change. Yeah, he's not going to change. You're not going to change. The notion is, if you're planning that you're going to have this huge apotheosis and you're going to be sainted for it, good luck. How do you build on what you got? So what I'm going to ask you to do is take these four points of view. I'm going to ask yourself to think about what doesn't work. You don't wake up at 2 in the morning going, oh, I'm so successful, it's incredible. You wake up at 2 in the morning going, what? I'm a total fraud, I'm a failure, it's all going to end tomorrow. You're a human being. And then when you're done with what doesn't work and you've emptied the chamber, ask yourself what does. And instead of trying to solve what doesn't work, try and build momentum on what does. You're all skilled. You're all amazing. But your dominant logic is so strong you're not seeing what you're amazing at. Once you've done that, I want you to think of your life in the new year as a portfolio. You have a portfolio life. And in a portfolio, what do you do? <clears throat> you buy and you sell. The biggest problem that people have when they make goals is they buy without selling. How many of you feel over capacity? You don't have to raise your hands. I know you're in the Air Force. But I bet you feel overstretched. I bet you thought over the break you were going to get a little breathing room. You're going to be able to recover. And most of you didn't get it. And what are you beginning to figure out? In order to write that book, you're going to have to do what? Quit Pilates. You're going to get a little squidgy around the edges. You know, you're going to have to, you know, maybe take, take a, a year off from the Humane Society. What are you willing to give up to create the capacity to be creative in your life? You want to write a novel? You want to build a business? You want to build a new device? You want to do something remarkable? Whatever it is, start cleaning out the closet because you don't have time unless you do that. And stop filling up your time with apps. That's the opium of task pursuit. Oh, look at I have an opening at 7.30. It'll always be filled. Once you've sold positions or, or reduced positions, only then add. What is it that I'm going to add, that I'm going to start doing? So instead of saying, I'm going to go to the gym for two hours every day, say, three times a week I'm going to get to the gym for 30 minutes. I'm going to add that. So three times a week, I, I wanted to learn how to paint. I'm going to paint. I used to be a great guitar player. I'm going to start playing the guitar again. I'm going to start adding creativity back into my life. The more the Air Force sucks it out, the more you're going to have to work hard to put it back in. And what's going to happen over time is you're going to find how what you've got in your life that's creative actually fits. You're going to find a place for it at work. And that's going to be amazing, but you're going to have to rebalance your portfolio life. And you start by, you're going to start this by stopping. Now here's a radical thought for the Air Force. It's radical. What if the whole key to innovation at the Air Force is not starting anything? What if it's stopping things? Let that sink in for a minute. What if the key to innovation here is not starting anything? It's simply stopping things. Creating capacity to do what you already, you already have. That's true for you. It's true for your own life. And only then start. And it doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. It doesn't mean you get rid of all the things that work. There are things you want to hold on to. <clears throat> and I'm a terrible hypocrite. I love innovation, but there are some things I do that are really ridiculously conventional. I sit in the same seat. I have to pay a ton of money to sit way far away at the University of Michigan football stadium, right? The largest stadium in North America, second largest stadium in the world, right? I drive an old, old Mercedes. It's really old. I won't, ch right? So the innovation guy doesn't like a lot of things. Somehow in my life, I have to create stability. Because if all you're doing is innovation stuff all the time, you have no moorings. So, things you can do as an artist. Things you can do as an artist. You can pilot things. You can, you can modify your room. Start a revolution. Things you can do as, a, as an engineer. 
You know, you can, you can start setting milestones. You can, you can put a budget together. You can read the fine prints. Things you could do as an athlete. <clears throat> Go the extra mile. Overcome boundaries. Tough it out. Right? Show that you've got some reserve. Finally, things you could do as a sage. Mentor somebody. Coach somebody. You know, uh, uh, resolve a conflict somehow. Empower someone. <clears throat> but remember, none of this matters unless you have an innovator's mindset. I want to leave you with a few things I think everybody really should do in putting their goals together for the next year. Instead of doing the traditional bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, task pursuit thing, write a story. You know, the frontal cortex of your brain is designed to make pictures, right? It's the modern part of your brain. It's move your fine digits and make pictures. Well, tell a story. What's going to happen to you at the end of the year? Because a story is, is going to be much closer to your creative apparatus than a bunch of bullet points are going to be or stupid PowerPoint slides. <clears throat> Produce a video. You got a phone? Talk to yourself. You know, I make all these videos. You, some people know I've had a PBS special and all this stuff. My favorite videos are ones that basically I make for myself, and even though I might post them, I go look at them at the end of the month. What did I say? What am I thinking? What's going on in Jeff's head here, right? Author a manifesto. I love manifestos. You know, the, the Communist Manifesto starts out with workers of the world unite. It's not, you know what I think I'm going to do? No! Make a declaration. Put it on your refrigerator. You know, invade. I don't know. Something. Something strong. <laughs> Build something, you know. <clears throat> Even if it's out of beer cans. I don't care. I, I know we're in Alabama. Whatever. Whatever works. <laughs> Draw a map. How do you get from here to there? J.R. Tolkien, right? The beginning of the Lord of the Rings. Paint a picture. Right? Do something very artistic. <clears throat> create, create a soundtrack. It's one of my favorites. Anybody else screwed into their ears like I am? I have a new mix I make every year. You know, some years it's Ride of the Valkyries. You know, other years, you know, other years it's Put on a Happy Face. Whatever it is, that's your soundtrack. That's your mojo. But most importantly, I want you to leave room for the stuff you don't know now. Just like the day you graduated from high school. Now, on the website here, I've done something for you. I've written a chapbook, about a 120-page book. It's a PDF, and if you go to this website and you go to book, it's called The Enlivened Self. I wrote it for you guys. It's free. You can download it as many times as you want. I'll make these slides available as a PDF to you, right, if you're interested in this. So the notion is I'm going to give you some clues how you can make your New Year's resolutions actually stick and help creativize your life. Thanks for having me. I'm going to take a few questions. Thank you. We got six minutes before they, before they pull me. Questions, comments, pushback. Who wants to fight? Come on. You're going to have a shot at the old professor here. All right. I, I stand up. And I think there are microphones. So stand up. Get a mic. Oh, she doesn't. She just wanted to stretch her arm. OK. I just wanted to embarrass you. No, I'm kidding. Who has a question, comment, or pushback? You're all just ready to go to the bar? Anyone? She has a question. And she sat right in front, too. She was right in front. That's a gunner, incidentally. That's a gunner for you right there. The rest of you back there, free riders, all your free riders. <laughs> First of all, who are you? Uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is Kitta Eckel from Bowling Green State University, Ohio. The first name again? Um, Kitta Eckel, Amanda. Amanda. Eckel. Yep. Nice to meet you, Amanda. Um, nice to meet you too, sir. Um, I think it was a very inspirational speech, um, and it, it talks to the, to the idea of you know, not thinking alike. And I was wondering what you think is important about having a group of people that don't think alike. Why is that a benefit, and um, why should we encourage that in the military, where, yes. we're, where we're taught to be so similar? The, the reason is simple. Um, dominant logic, or conventional thinking, Amanda, happens when you surround yourself with people who are like you. Right? That's where the dominant logic and the Dunning-Kruger effect kicks in, where, where because you don't see the loyal opposition in any meaningful way, you don't have to make provision for it. The second worst thing you can do is to compromise across groups. And I like the talk this morning. It was a great example of not doing that. What you really want to do is to engage in conflict that's respectful. This is very key. It's respectful conflict. You, you don't say derogatory things. Now, don't get me wrong. It's human behavior. You're going to have a few. There's going to be some fur flying every now and then. 
But the notion is what you're trying to do is get to a shared vision. That's the key. So start by surrounding yourself with a diverse group of people. Next, engage. Because there's diverse groups of people where you're at, but you're not engaging them. You're not saying, well, why do you think that? You know, I don't agree with that. And then third, create that shared vision. Because once you've got the shared vision, then you can take all these different points of view and you can harness them in a better way. And that's what these creativity clusters do. And that's why that's key. Now, this is important. Is there a time in the military not to be creative? Yes. There's a lot of times in the military not to be creative. That's called situational awareness. There's a lot of times in the military you should salute and do exactly as your commanding officer tells you to do. But there's also times in the military where somebody needs a creative solution, where the conventional solution isn't working. So I want you to think, Amanda, about your life like a bell curve. Can we do that for a minute? Are you imagining a bell curve? I want you to think about when you really change or need to change. Is it in the middle, when everything's okay? When do you really change? When your life's in a crisis, right? When you got an F at Bowling Green, or your boyfriend broke up with you, or something horrible happened to a friend. And the reason you change then is the risk of trying something radical, and the reward of staying where you're at is reversed. Is this making sense? The other time you change is when you got an A+, plus and you got a scholarship from the Air Force, and somebody gave you a promotion and told you you were the best person ever, that's what we call risk capital. And you change when things are outstanding because the risk of trying something radical and the reward of staying where you're at, Amanda, is reversed. So here's the thing to think about in your life. Innovation and creativity doesn't work from the inside out. It works from the outside in. So there's a lot of, is this making sense to you? So the, the big thing is situational awareness. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I Thank really appreciate you. it. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Someone else. Questions, comments, pushback. I think that's it. We'll call it a wrap. Off to the bar with all of you.